Chapter twenty eight of the UP Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Beauty Stanton opened her eyes to see blue sky through the ragged vents of a worn out canvas tent. An unusual quietness all around added to the strange unreality of her situation. She heard only a low, mournful seeping of wind blown sand. Where was she? What had happened? was this only a vivid fearful dream she felt stiff unable to move did a ponderous weight hold her down her body seemed immense full of dull horrible ache and she had no sensation of lower limbs except a creeping cold slowly she moved her eyes around yes she was in a tent an abandoned tent old ragged dirty and she lay on the bare ground through a wide tear in the canvas she saw a stretch of flat ground covered with stakes and boards and denuded frameworks and piles of debris. Then grim reality entered her consciousness. Benton was evacuated. Benton was depopulated. Benton, houses, tents, people, had moved away. During her unconsciousness, perhaps while she had been thought dead, she had been carried to this abandoned tent. A dressing gown covered her, the one she always put on in the first hours after arising. The white dress she had worn last night, was it last night, still adorned her, but all her jewelry had been taken. Then she remembered being lifted to a couch and cried over by her girls, while awestruck men came to look at her and talk among themselves. But she had heard how the cowboy's shot had doomed her, how he had fought his way out, only to fall dead in the street and leave the girl to be taken by Durade. Now Beauty Stanton realized that she had been left alone in an abandoned tent of an abandoned camp to die. She became more conscious then of dull physical agony, but neither fear of death nor thought of pain occupied her mind that suddenly awoke to remorse. With the slow ebbing of her life, evil had passed out, if she had been given a choice between the salvation of her soul and to have Neil with her in her last moments, to tell him the truth, to beg his forgiveness, to die in his arms, she would have chosen the latter. Would not some trooper come before she died, someone to whom she could entrust a message, some grave digger? For the great U.P.R. buried the dead it left in its bloody track. With strange, numb hands, Stanton searched the pockets of her dressing gown to find, at length, a little account book with pencil attached. Then, with stiffened fingers but acute mind, she began to write to Neil. As she wrote, into each word went something of the pang, the remorse, the sorrow, the love she felt. And when that letter was ended, she laid the little book on her breast and knew for the first time in many years peace. She endured the physical agony. She did not cry out or complain or repent or pray. Most of the spiritual emotion and life left in her had gone into the letter. Memory called up only the last moments of her life when she saw Ancliffe die, when she folded innocent Allie Lee to her breast that had always yearned for a child, when Neil and his monstrous stupidity had misunderstood her when he had struck her before the grinning crowd and in burning words branded her with the one name unpardonable to her class when at the climax of a morbid and all-consuming hate a hate of the ruined woman whose body and mind had absorbed the vile dregs the dark fire and poison of lustful men she had inhumanly given allie lee to the man she had believed the wildest most depraved and most dangerous brute in all Benton. When this Larry King, by some strange fatality, becoming as great as he was wild, had stalked out to meet her like some red and terrible death, she remembered now that strange icy gloom and shudder she had always felt in the presence of the cowboy. Within her vitals now was the same cold, deadly, sickening sensation, and it was death always she had anticipated it but vaguely unrealizingly larry king had lifted the burden of her life she would have been glad if only neil had understood her that was her last wavering conscious thought 
Now she drifted from human consciousness to the instinctive physical struggle of the animal to live, and that was not strong. There came a moment, the last between life and death, when Beauty Stanton's soul lingered on the threshold of its lonely and eternal pilgrimage, and then drifted across the gray shadows into the unknown, out to the great beyond. Casey leaned on his spade while he wiped the sweat from his brow and regarded his ally, McDermott. Between them yawned a grave they had been digging, and near at hand a long, quiet form wrapped in old canvas. "'Mac, I'll be damned if I like this job,' said Casey, drawing hard at his black pipe. "'Yes, want to be a director of the UPR, huh?' replied McDermott. "'Sure, and I've did every job but run an engine.' It's imposed on we are, Mac. Them troopers never work. Why wouldn't they plant these stiffs? Casey, I reckon no one's bossing us. Benton picked up and moved yesterday. And we'll be going soon with a gravel train. It's only decent of us to bury the remains of Benton. And sure, you ought to be glad to see that awful red-head cowboy go under the ground. And for why, queried Casey. Didn't you throw a gun on yous once and scare the daylights out of yous? Mac, I was as cool as a cucumber. And as to bury it, Larry King, I'm proud and sorry. He was Neil's friend. My God, but he weren't worth chain lightning, Casey. He said he shot the woman Stanton, too. Mac, there was a dumb lie, I bet, replied Casey. He shot up Stanton's hall, and a bullet from some of them what were fighting him must have hit her. Maybe but it were bad business. That cowboy hit every one of them fellows in the same place. Sure they never blinked after it. And, Mac, the best and dirtiest job we've had on this U.P. was the planting of them fellows. Casey's huge hand indicated a row of freshly filled graves over which the desert sand was seeping. Then, dropping his spade, he bent to the quiet figure. They hold, Mac. They lowered the corpse into the hole. Casey stood up, making a sign of the cross before him. He were a man. Then they filled the grave. Mac, wouldn't it be decent to mark where Larry King's buried? A stone or a wooden cross with his name? McDermott winked his red brow and scratched his sandy beard. Then he pointed. Casey, what's the use? See, the blowing sands have covered all the graves. Mac, you was always hell at shirking work. Come on now. Drill, you tear your drill. They quickly dug another long, narrow hole. Then, taking a rude stretcher, they plodded away in the direction of a dilapidated tent that appeared to be the only structure left of Benton. Casey entered ahead of his comrade. That's strange. What? queried McDermott. Didn't you cover her face when we laid her down here? Sure, and I did, Casey. And that face had a different look now. Maxie here. Casey stooped to pick up a little book from the woman's breast. His huge fingers opened it with difficulty. Mac, there's writing in it, he exclaimed. Well, rage, baboon. Oh, I can read it, though I ain't much of a writer myself, replied Casey, and then laboriously began to decipher the writing. He halted suddenly and looked keenly at McDermott. What the devil? Begore, it's to me friend Neil. And the love letter, and well, keep it then for Neil and be decent enough to read no more. Lifting Beauty Stanton, they carried her out into the sunlight. Her white face was a shadowed and tragic record. Mac, she was sure a handsome woman, said Casey, and a lady. Casey was always sorry for somebody. That Stanton was a beauty, and she maybe was a lady, but she was dumb bad. Mac, I knowed long ago that the milk of human kindness had curdled in yous, and yous have no brains. I'm as intelligent as yous any day, retorted McDermott. Then why hadn't you seen that this poor woman was alive when they packed her out here? She come to and wrote that letter to Neil. Then she died. My God, Casey, yous ain't meaning it, ejaculated McDermott, aghast. Casey nodded grimly and then knelt to listen at Stanton's breast. Stone dead now, that's sure. For her shroud, these deliberate men used strippings of canvas from the tent, and then carrying her up the bare and sandy slope, 
they lowered her into the grave next to the one of the cowboy again casey made a sign of the cross he worked longer at the filling in than his comrade and patted the mound of sand hard and smooth when he finished his pipe was out he relighted it well beauty stanton sure yous have a cleaner grave than yous had a bed nice white desert sand and presently no man will ever know where you's come to lay the laborers shouldered their spades and plodded away the wind blew steadily in from the desert seeping the sand in low thin sheets afternoon waned the sun sank twilight crept over the barren waste there were no sounds but the seep of sand the moan of wind the mourn of wolf loneliness came with the night that mantled beauty stanton's grave shadows trooped in from the desert and the darkness grew black on that slope the wind always blew and always the sand seeped dusting over everything imperceptibly changing the surface of the earth the desert was still at work nature was no respecter of graves life was nothing radiant cold stars blinked piteously out of the vast blue-black vault of heaven but there hovered a spirit beside this woman's last resting place a spirit like the night sad lonely silent mystical immense and as it hovered over hers so it hovered over other nameless graves in the eternal workshop of nature the tenants of these unnamed and forgotten graves would mingle dust of good with dust of evil and by the divinity of death resolve equally into the elements again the place that had known benton knew it no more coyotes barked dismally down what had been the famous street of the camp and prowled in and out of the piles of debris and frames of wood gone was the low strange roar that had been neither music nor mirth nor labor benton remained only a name the sun rose upon a squalid scene a wide flat area where stakes and floors and frames mingled with all the flotsam and jetsam left by a hurried and profligate populace moving on to another camp daylight found no man there nor any living creature and all day the wind blew the dust and sheets of sand over the place where had reigned such strife of toil and gold and lust and blood and death a train passed that day out of which engineer and fireman gazed with wondering eyes at what had been benton like a mushroom it had arisen and like a dust storm on the desert wind it had roared away bearing its freight of labor of passion and of evil benton had become a name a fabulous name but nature seemed more merciful than life for it began to hide what men had left the scars of habitations where hell had held high carnival sunset came then night and the starlight the lonely hours were winged as if in hurry to resolve back into the elements the flimsy remains of that great camp and that spot was haunted End of chapter twenty eight